got two Sun Shield motors enabled at this time. We copy. The new frontier is space. A place for people to go, to explore, to expand their horizons. Oh, thanks. We copy, PJ. Got a good shot of Mother Earth behind you there, Story. A flying machine, the space shuttle, finally has made space available to everyone. The astronauts today work and play in space. They even launch satellites from their cargo hold. This is a hundred million dollar commercial satellite being launched to relay telephone, television, and computer communications. And that's real pretty. That's my first view of it. Beautiful. Here on Earth in the 1980s, these boys and girls prepare experiments at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. They dream of space, knowing their dreams can come true. Like a man's match? Yeah, I think we did that a while. These explorer scouts are assembling 10 experiments, from tracking cosmic rays to growing crystals. Their tiny space lab will be carried on a future shuttle mission as a getaway special. In Space Talk, Getaway special canisters on the shuttle are called gas cans. You can buy reservations for only a few thousand dollars. And groups like the Scouts even get theirs free, paid for by major aerospace companies. You can send up almost anything within reason, except people. To be able to look at the environment, the space, to see how it affects all sorts of different items. Space is still the exclusive province of astronauts and specially trained scientists and engineers. I'm Roy Neal, K6DUE, and I've been covering the space program since it began. In those early days, people used to look through telescopes like this one and wonder what was up there. And then, 25 years ago, it all began to change. The huge holds of today's space shuttles can carry as much cargo as an 18-wheeler rolling along on the highways. Quite literally, they've opened the doors of space. But the real explorers remain the astronauts, highly trained professionals who use computers to fly their spaceships and high technology to develop new ways of using space to better our way of life. And their communication links, till now, have been exclusive. Astronauts only talk to astronauts between mission control and orbiting spacecraft. Okay, uh, I activated it at uh, two days, 20 hours, 43 minutes, and as soon as we started the system status check... Get that Navy stuff mixed up. We can tell you're steely-eyed from here. Turn it down just a little to get the glare off of it. There, in 11 years of aviation experience. All right. <laughs> Uh, we try to of course, there were a few exceptions to the astronaut-only talk. Richard, first of all, congratulations on the continued success of your mission. I understand you're even ahead of schedule. Well, we like to stay that way, Mr. President. <laughs> okay, this is W5LFL in uh, Columbia Space Lab approaching the Aleutian Islands. Now there's something new in space. Is, uh, 1302. Astronaut Owen Garriott, also known as Amateur Radio Operator W5LFL, was given permission by NASA to operate his ham gear during STS-9, the ninth flight of a space shuttle, and this was a dress rehearsal. So many fellows calling me, I couldn't keep them all straight. So I got Q5 signals from W7 uh, Roger George uh, Hotel, W5 Sugar William X-Ray, W5 Uncle Quebec, and W5 uh, Foxtrot Item Victor. 
It's a simple battery-operated station, a walkie-talkie transceiver, a tiny astronaut's tape recorder and lightweight headset, and an antenna stuck in a window on the flight deck. We will look for those orbits on which I'm going to be off-duty. Uh, then we'll see what part of the uh, world's surface uh, the spacecraft will be passing over. Then we have to check to see what the spacecraft attitude is, because if the spacecraft is oriented so that the window out uh, through which our antenna is pointed is out to the stars, of course, we cannot talk to the Earth. And so when the uh, spacecraft attitude is such that the window is looking toward the Earth, uh, then we can attempt some communication. Amateur radio operators and clubs have precise times and frequencies for space communication. They broadcast such information around the world using more traditional earthbound stations and ham networks to spread the word. There will be uh, two or three frequencies, which we will make sure everyone knows about, on which I'll plan to transmit. We'll have a much larger group, 10 or 15 or 20 frequencies, on which I intend to receive. And so I'll probably send, uh, just stay on one transmit frequency as long as that channel remains clear. And uh, then receive at the other uh, 10 or 15 or 20 uh, spots as we travel around the uh, Earth. A word of caution. Only licensed amateurs can talk to Owen. But there are no restrictions on listening to the ham radio signals from space. Owen Garriott, W5LFL, may be the first amateur radio operator in space, but amateur stations have been flying unmanned up there for years. There's even an organization, the Amateur Satellite Corporation, AMSAT, that builds them and operates them. They're called OSCARS, Orbiting Satellites Carrying Amateur Radio. Built by amateurs throughout the world, there have been 10 of these small communication satellites, growing increasingly more capable and sophisticated over the years. They are used to relay or repeat ham signals from one side of the world to the other. Here they're operating Oscar number 10. AMSAT's Jan King, W3GEY, considers Owen Garriott's flight historic. It's, of course, a big boost for amateur radio in the sense that this is the first time that a man will operate from space with, with an amateur communications equipment. And we hope it's setting a precedent for the future, one that's... Uh, very important uh, to our hobby in, in, a very, in a very different way, and that is that we can show the utility in longer range communications when man perhaps goes to Mars, the moon. W Owen Garriott is a ham radio operator. He also holds a doctor's degree from Stanford University in electrical engineering. He signed on with NASA as a scientist astronaut in 1965 and spent two months in space in Skylab in 1973. Along with Alan Bean and Jack Lausma, he took part in medical experiments. Studied solar flares. They took 40,000 sun pictures. 16,000 more pictures of the Earth as they studied what makes our world and how to live above it in orbit. The flight of STS-9 carries a space lab on its first trip into space. This is a new large unit built by a consortium of European nations. This flight reminds Garriott of his earlier one. His only regret, the amount of time on orbit. It's only going to be nine days long. And when I compare that with the uh, 60 days that we had on Skylab, it's a little disappointing that we can't do full justice to all of the really sophisticated and uh, uh, fantastic equipment that we're going to carry into orbit with us. And so it's still going to be an exploratory type mission. I'd just really love to have a lot more time to operate this expensive array of uh, sophisticated equipment, more time to devote to the ham radio uh, aspects, which I'd like very much to do, but it's going to have to be limited because of all of our other uh, workloads. And uh, uh, just uh, an, another great expectation. I expect it to rate right up there with the Skylab experience from 10 years ago. 50 years ago, the invention of the vacuum tube revolutionized radio. Today, it's computers microprocessors, games, computers are changing our way of life by opening new avenues of thought and communication. Amateur radio operators once opened the world of shortwave by discovering new ways of using tubes. Today their basic equipment is mostly solid state, transistorized, and built-in computers make it easier and better to operate. There are many other specialized forms of communication, to name just a few. Radio teletype, amateur television, 
repeaters that take weak signals from handy talkies and give them louder voices and longer range. There are a million and a half hams spread around the world that each one has a distinctive radio identification, call letters. Amateurs in the United States and Canada, 130,000 of them have an organization, the American Radio Relay League, and its president is Vic Clark, W4KFC. In the past 10 years, we have seen a doubling of the number of amateur radio operators in the world. Its future, I would say, is, is very bright. Uh, amateur radio is diversifying into many fields. We have satellites aloft. We're now looking forward to the first space shuttle uh, operated by a radio amateur. The uh, uh, experimentation has gone into fields such as radio teletype, uh, slow scan TV, and many other forms of uh, communication. Uh, so that uh, there is no wearing out of the activity. The ARRL is headquartered in Newington, Connecticut, where it operates a powerful radio station that transmits news and information, including code practice, in a worldwide service. Call letters, W1AW. It publishes QST, a ham magazine devoted to telling amateurs what's going on in their world and other publications, such as a handbook. There are books for would-be hams on how to get a license. The league's general manager is David Sumner, K1ZZ. It is a technical hobby, but it's not one that, uh, is, that really should scare people away. Uh, most amateurs today uh, uh, are using equipment which is manufactured. They assemble it in, into a station which meets their particular needs, but this isn't any different than, for example, the hi-fi enthusiast who has a wide variety of equipment available and puts together the components that uh, meets his particular needs. And I don't think most of us regard hi-fi as being that technical that, we'd, that we would shy away from it for that reason. W1AW, the league station, is elaborate like many club stations, but most amateurs have their equipment at home, and they share the motivation that once led Owen Garriott into ham radio. Owen still enjoys operating the DX, or long-distance bands, and he remembers how he got into the hobby. I was still in high school, and my uh, dad came home uh, from work one day and said, a friend of his up at the office was going to be teaching a code class, and would I like to come along with him? And so at that uh, point, having nothing too much else to do in the evenings, I started going to code class with my father for a period of, uh, oh, I guess three or four months at the uh, Enid Amateur Radio Club, still in existence, W5 Hot Tea Kettle in Enid, Oklahoma. And then uh, a few months later, he said, well, this uh, friend is also going to be teaching a theory class down at the local high school, and would I like to come along to that? So I was still game, and uh, my father and I ended up going through both the code and theory classes and uh, getting our licenses uh, just toward the end of World War II. So that's been quite a while. Owen Garriott became W5LFL, and his amateur radio inspired him. And this is no question in my mind, but uh, way back in high school, uh, almost uh, an accidental event uh, with my father has certainly had a significant impact on uh, my professional career. For the flight of STS-9, the spaceship Columbia which flew the first five shuttle missions, was completely refurbished, modernized at Cape Canaveral. Its immensely complex hardware showed clearly, shortly before it was mated to a payload. Space Lab 1, 23 feet long, 15 feet in diameter, a big payload even for shuttles. The astronauts have been working out in a Space Lab simulator at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. That's Bob Parker, a mission specialist, who will team with Dr. Garriott. They'll split, each working 12 hours on, 12 off, studying the stars and the Earth. When people go into space, this is their point of departure. Launch pad 39 at the Kennedy Space Center. And when future astronauts go out to man orbiting space station, to colonize the moon, or to explore Mars, they will take communicators with them. And that, perhaps, is a future facet of amateur radio. These are some of the projects on the drawing boards of NASA. Wild looking, perhaps? Not really. Not when compared to the shuttle in the perspective of 50 years ago, when a comic book hero, Buck Rogers, was the model for space. One person in every 550 in the United States is a ham radio operator. But a much higher percentage than that can expect to be part of the future. The hams envision their base stations on the moon. Their exploration shared not only on NASA communications, but on some of their own. 
Space has a future, and ham radio expects to be a vital part of it. Owen Garriott's flight is only the beginning. I think the principal impact will be as a demonstration uh, to the uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, amateurs and hams, not only in the U.S., but all over the world, uh, that they can indeed play a personal role in uh, space activities. Uh, they've been doing it to some extent via the unmanned satellites, uh, OSCAR, which operate as repeaters, uh, but uh, now there will be a chance for uh, uh, people uh, persons to really uh, be involved in two-way communications from space. The communicators of amateur radio are on their way to the new frontier of space, and no one, no one can predict exactly how far they'll go. Roy Neal, K6DUE. Seven, six, we have main engine ignition, four, three, two, one, Zero and liftoff, liftoff of the Orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the space shuttle. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Challenger's underway, we got Houston copies, Challenger. Seconds elapsed. Throttles on all three main engines coming down to 81 percent. Velocity 2,000 feet per second. Altitude three and a half miles. Downrange two miles. Downrange, 14 miles. Velocity, 5,100 feet per second. 20 miles in altitude. Uh, downrange, 22 nautical miles. Standing microsolid rocket booster separation. SRP-7 was at some. 